Lisa. Good morning, everyone in Montana, Colorado, and Utah. I'm thrilled to um, provide information related to pediatric trauma management for all of you. Although um, the presentation has the title Pediatric Trauma and Review of Utah Emergency Medical Services for Children um, Offline Protocols, this actually, these protocols are uh, general um, uh, management strategies that can be implemented at both the BLS and ALS level. And so um, any feedback any of you have, um, Russ uh, will be happy um, to get um, at the conclusion of the um, presentation. Um, first and foremost, though, I would like to talk about what our objectives are and how we'll be spending the next hour. Specifically, we're going to be looking at trauma resuscitation principles for pediatric patients, differences in pediatric assessment, um, and anticipatory guidance, um, because many of you I know are not only EMS providers, but are parents involved in um, your children's activities and are asked, because you're a medical provider, what should we do about this? We're going to talk specifically about the growth and development and how that can um, provide a different strategy in your assessment because the child's body is different than an adult in a trauma situation. And then with each of these areas, we'll talk about the basic guidelines and protocols for care of these patients in the field. Finally, I cannot, um, any of you um, who may know me or the people in this room that are sitting here, no, I can't talk about pediatric trauma without injury prevention. They go hand in hand, and each of us as adults have a responsibility to uh, promote um, injury prevention um, for both our own families as well as uh, the children we interact with. So first and foremost, trauma resuscitation for the pediatric patient, the principles are exactly the same as they are for the adult, and that's airway breathing, circulation, a brief neuro exam, and exposing the patients for other less obvious injuries. When uh, we do a secondary survey after we get that primary survey completed, again, it's head to toe, front to back. That's the same no matter if they've been involved in a car crash, fallen out of a window, fall off of a ski lift, um, or part of non-accidental trauma um, also. Also included, remember with pediatric patients, your history is essential. We don't always have the luxury of having an adult um, be present with that child. Many times the child is nonverbal. So what are um, their sample history? What does this include? And you can read through our list, allergies, medications, past medical or surgical history. If kids are under a year, we always want to know their birth history. Was it an uncomplicated delivery or were there problems? When did they eat? And remember, with kids, they eat all the time. So instead of asking the last meal, ask what was the last thing the child ate and at what time. And then events leading to the incident and uh, finally um, determining a plan. Now I'm going to take one minute for those of you who are within the Utah um, area and even more specifically along the Wasatch Front. Uh, the level one trauma centers have a very uh, direct approach that's used as patients enter the trauma bay. These are not just uh, single uh, injuries or mild injuries. These are bad enough to call a full trauma team response. And I'm providing this information um, as a reminder. As you enter the trauma bay, as you can see, on our um, top, our uh, EMS vitals report essentially means just what is your last set of vitals before the patient gets transferred, and are there any from the bed to the uh, from the gurney to the bed in the trauma bay, and were there any issues with airway? Then the trauma team does their primary assessment, confirming if the child is innovated, is it good to placement? Do we still have bilateral breast sounds, and do we still have strong pulses? Then, um, once our ABCs are conf um, confirmed and the patient's exposed, we look for a complete EMS report, and we use V-Train as our mnemonic, meaning what is the um, time of the injury, the age, and gender. So I have a four-year-old male involved in a motor vehicle crash at approximately 10 a.m. this morning. Known injuries include a deformed left arm, a rigid belly, and uh, dried blood at the nares. Any assessment changes. My GCS has been 13 to 14 throughout our transport. 
Um, and here are my other exam findings. And then interventions. We immobilized the patient. We provided a single bolus of fluids or blow by oxygen or whatever your interventions were. And then any history you were able to obtain if you have the luxury of having that history. You'll notice after that uh, brief and concise report, we go right into um, finishing our assessment and um, hospital-related activities. And using this approach with every single uh, severely injured patient provides a very efficient, streamlined, and accurate way to get life-threatening injuries identified quickly and dealt with and then move on to less um, threatening injuries and ultimately definitive care. So that's just something um, that uh, we're using here at the Level 1 Trauma Centers in Salt Lake City and um, may be in use in other hospitals uh, throughout the region. Um, continuing on now, as we just talk a little bit about the pediatric differences, one of the primary concerns with uh, trauma is to avoid hypoxia and hypotension. That clearly relates to maintaining not only a patent airway, but adequate ventilation that these uh, kids need with oxygenation and good uh, ventilatory effort if they require it. It also means we need to keep them well perfused. And those of you that are able to provide uh, intravenous access um, know that our standard of care oops, pardon me, is uh, 20 cc's per kilo of NS or LR, whatever your agency is carrying, and reassessing um, critical. We'll talk more about that in the uh, protocols. Um, the reason I'm bringing that up early in the presentation as we talk about the other uh, protocols is because if you look at the statistics here, and I'm not sure how easy this is for you to see um, in the outline because they're uh, different colors, but essentially we've got respiratory rate, systolic blood pressure, and Glasgow coma score. And in um, kids with um, multiple traumatic injuries, if you had a normal respiratory rate normal systolic blood pressure, and normal Glasgow coma, you can see the those who died are in single digits. It's rare that that occurs. But if you have an abnormality, 31% of over 32,000 cases reviewed that had abnormal respiratory rate of that group, 25% had mortality and died. A systolic blood pressure being abnormal in a tiny percentage, but look at 50% um, death rate. And 50%, excuse me, died, and then 38% with an abnormal Glasgow coma score. We had a fourth of um, those with a pediatric trauma score less than eight that had death. So maintaining uh, within normal parameter vital signs uh, is essential. To do that, it's great to have references, and many um, EMS agencies, flight crews, pediatric emergency departments, community hospitals have uh, begun using the Braslow tape, which has use of the red end of the tape at the head, and then a color correlates with where the heel of the patient uh, presents as you line the tape up right next to the patient. Uh, this information not only provides uh, vital signs printed on the uh, Braslow tape, but also drug dosages and the appropriate equipment size choices. So I, we encourage, we use it in our emergency department at Primary Children's Hospital, the Braslow tape uh, for efficient um, weight estimates and then uh, transitioning to accurate dosing um, and use of equipment. I put up this slide, and you're going to say, Lisa, we can't even read this. What's what's the deal with this crazy slide? What it this slide is meant to represent there are vital sign parameters unique to each age group. And whatever reference you use, whether it's in the pocket of your, um, uh, your coat or your pants, whether it's um, in your lab coat pocket in the hospital that you may uh, work at, whatever reference you use, just know that's the reference point when you look at that monitor or feeling that pulse or are counting those respirations that tells you, is my patient within normal parameters for age? Do not memorize this. There are a number of references. I encourage anyone working with pediatrics, whether it's one child a year or one child every hour if you're um, in a, a busier area, to have a great reference, and then uh, you can more efficiently work to um, care for that patient. Now, just briefly, as we start into the protocols and how growth and development affects um, care of patients of different ages, um, Emergency Medical Services for Children in Utah developed offline protocols um, because one-third of the advanced life support agencies did not have offline medical direction, and three-fifths of the 
basic life support agencies did not have offline medical direction. This protocol training began last fall and is in progress as we speak. And I've listed on uh, the slide here at um, health.utah.gov slash EMS slash EMSC um, as where you, uh, location where you can review these uh, protocols and um, look at specifics. And there's an entire list of these. There are also um, PowerPoint um, video stream presentations that review uh, these protocols. Uh, Emergency Medical Services was a federal grant program that started um, here in Utah, um, combining the Bureau of EMS with resources from our children's hospital, primary children's, to get optimal pediatric um, patient care, injury prevention, and research uh, throughout our area. And we're fortunate that in our Intermountain region, we have strong EMSC resources um, to continue that effort. Um, so who developed these protocols we're going to talk about? People who care for kids. And I think that's important because that's the unique um, perspective that gets um, the best information, uh, best practice out to every one of us that needs it in our daily work. These are EMSC advisory um, committee members, um, EMS providers, pediatric specialists from uh, primary children's with physicians, nurses, and EMS providers. And just one last note, these are guidelines for field care management. Um, they're not set in stone uh, protocols, although we loosely use the uh, term protocols, but they are guidelines to direct and provide uh, care. So let's get into the meat of the presentation right now, and that is we will be covering the five major topic areas with the five associated EMSC protocols um, for closed head injury, spinal immobilization, blunt trauma, penetrating trauma, and non-accidental trauma. And with each of these, what I hope to do is provide the unique anatomic differences for the why we treat kids um, differently um, and provide you with those resources. So let's start with closed head injury as this is the most common both uh, mild as well as severe injury that uh, is seen in the pediatric population. This refers by definition to any infant or child with non-penetrating head trauma, we'll talk later about penetrating injuries, um, with traumatic brain injury, TBI. Mild, by definition, means their, that patient's Glasgow coma score is between 13 and 15. Moderate means your Glasgow coma score is uh, less than 13 after a traumatic uh, brain injury. And, of course, I'm going to go back to my uh, prevention with uh, bike helmets. So what causes head injury in kids? Any of you who are parents can think about how old are your own kids and how do they often get hurt and come, hey, you know, I'm hurt or my sister, my brother fell. Well, if you're less than two years of age, the common cause is either by falling, and that can be from any level, or from abuse. And just know that those are the two most common reasons. If you can keep that in mind, you'll have a higher degree of suspicion if a particular scenario does not fit the description and you need to become the advocate for the child in the case of non-accidental trauma. For the two to five year olds, it now relates to falls but motor vehicle. These are children who are occupants within a motor vehicle and 100% they are dependent on their adult, their parent, their grandparent, uh, neighbor to have them properly restrained. And we'll talk at the very end of the lecture about how um, incorrectly kids are restrained and how we need to continue to get the word out for using appropriate sized car seats um, through age levels. With the 6 to 12 year olds, once kids get into the school setting, we have motor vehicles, but when we refer to this, this is related to not only occupant poorly restrained, but also an auto versus pedestrian too, being struck as they're coming and going. They are on bicycles, they're more mobile, they start riding motorbikes and ATVs. And I can also put it, especially this time of the year, many of you have probably seen what we've seen, and those are um, children in the school age age group on snowmobiles or ATVs on a winter environment that experience trauma. Finally, in our 13 to 18 year old adolescent group, these are motor vehicles where they're now becoming the drivers, but also keep in mind these kids are actively participating in sports and some at a very high level of uh, competition, which means that they, the intensity is even has escalated um, through their little sports career and sometimes um, uh, injury prevention and we'll talk about return to play, um, come into play, that we might be causing more injuries for these kids. Also, um, please be aware, violent assaults are uh, 
uh, on the rise during this adolescent group. Who is getting hurt and what is happening to them related to closed head and face injuries? Well, by anatomic growth and development, if you're less than five years old, you're less likely to have fractures. I'm not saying you won't, but the incidence is less, and that's purely because of anatomy. The bone is not um, cortical or more calcified and hardened. We have kids in this group have under undeveloped sinuses. Those areas are not as large as they are in the adult skull. We'll, I will look at a couple of um, photos for that. They have thicker, softer tissues around the face, um, shorter distance of falls. Um, they're not from, not always from high heights, although we have a number of kids that fall out of windows in the spring. And um, generally speaking, there's more supervision for this type of group. And I say that generally speaking because I'm continually surprised at how unsupervised this group can be. But if you're over five, you're more susceptible to facial fractures, and that's because your mandible and maxilla, so that is your jaw and the bones over your cheek, are um, developing. And as you'll see in a picture we have coming up, you've got a ton of developing teeth, so there's greater chance for disruption there. You've got more prominent facial bone, and they're involved in more outdoor, so higher impact activities. So let's just look at a couple of pictures, because again, this is going to come into play. You see that child that's fallen, that's involved in a crash. Well, here the head is proportionately larger with a softer, thinner skull like we refer to. When I talk about prominent occipital region, that's this posterior aspect of the skull right here. There's craniofacial disproportion, which is better shown in the next slide, and the bridging veins within the brain are more easily torn because that's developing and there's a larger space there for shear. Um, and that what we're talking about is that subarachnoid uh, space. So let's take a look at that developing skull. As we go from the left to the right side, here's our adult skull. Here is our young and developing skull. You can look at this prominent forehead area, greater occiput area. Look how this jaw is underneath where the uh, mandible or jawline is more prominent as that skull grows and matures. Um, and that's why these frontal and orbital areas in younger kids are more prone to trauma when they do fall um, because it's, uh, it's less protected than you see in the adult skull. Um, this side view gives you a little bit different perspective. Um, as we see the frontal, parietal, and occipital bones, you can see how the proportion and size varies and how that jaw becomes far more prominent in the adult skull versus um, where that's so prominent in the um, younger skull. Um, this brittleness increases after age three and can provide differing patterns of injury as that child continues uh, to age. And so we start from a vertically short, resilient structure and end as an elongated, project, projecting less resilient. And I think showing you these photos helps you appreciate when you come upon, upon the motor vehicle crash or when you think about that potential shaken baby um, and impact that um, they may have had, um, how their skull itself is so different uh, than the adults. Here's that picture I was referring to with uh, what you normally see with a kid's little baby teeth present, but then the developing teeth are shown in black, telling you that when you have fractures that cut across, many of you are familiar with Lafort fractures, you may see in an adult population. Well, in a child, we also have to think as we're piecing together um, and our plastic surgeons are working to reconstruct these facial bones, what is the dentition, where is the dentition at, and how well is that forming? So just again, to give you a greater appreciation for that developing um, face and skull. So closed head injury, we've looked at the anatomy. How do these um, patients present? Well, the child may be confused, combative, or unresponsive. Remember, we refer to a mild traumatic brain injury versus severe traumatic brain injury. They may or may not have an associated skull fracture because of those softer tissues around the head um, and face. Um, or other injuries, spine, chest, abdomen, or extremities. They may develop the hypoxia we referred to at the start of the lecture, poor oxygen saturation, hypotension, alterations in respiratory drive, and unequal or unresponsive pupils. So this gives you that continuum that you are assessing for as you first meet that patient in a field environment. Um, many of you are familiar with AFPU. Is the patient alert? 
Are they responding to verbal stimulation? Are they only responding to painful stimulation or are they completely unresponsive? And I've inserted this chart in here because it's a quick and efficient neurologic exam to give initially in the field. When you can report in your radio report, I have an alert seven-year-old uh, that fell from a uh, uh, deck uh, onto soft grass. Or I have an unresponsive three-year-old that fell from a second-story window onto a cement driveway. So a lot of information giving a clear picture for the ongoing care of that patient um, as you deliver them to definitive care. The Glasgow Coma Scale is used. We are all familiar with it. But what I'd like you to do is on your reference cards that each of you have, and your varied forms is take a minute after the presentation today become, to become more familiar with the pediatric uh, portion. If you look at eye opening, we're pretty much the same as far as are they spontaneously opening their eye or opening their eyes to speech or sound. But in the infants, as we get into verbal, you'll see is that infant having appropriate words, sounds, or social smile? Are they crying but consolable, which is equating to confused? Or are they persistently irritable? Are they restless or agitated? Or is there no response? And being more comfortable with what that criteria is for the different scoring makes you better at assessment and then communicating your assessment to your uh, medical direction for ongoing uh, care as you deliver that patient. So here's symptoms of concussion. And I put this up, and I'm not sure if you're able to read this as well. Um, the cognitive symptoms of concussion, how we think, talk about hard time concentrating, trouble remembering, mental fogginess, confusion, slow speech of thinking, delayed reaction time. All of you may have this in the morning before that first cup of coffee or Diet Coke or whatever you've got going while you're trying to get your day started. But this is very much a part of the kid who's had a uh, uh, concussion. Emotional or behavioral, personality changes, irritability, depression, or the things that you are asking about. Does your head hurt? Are you dizzy? Do you feel like you need to throw up? Can, is the patient able to walk or ambulate with good coordination? Are they tired? Are they sensitive to light and sound? This physical symptom list is so easy for us to assess, but you've got to stay on top of it with some of the less um, obvious signs also. The reason we bring that up is because there are simple concussions. Many of you who help coach, coach your children's uh, football or soccer teams or um, maybe your daughters are cheerleaders or you're on, they're playing basketball, um, it, these are things that kids collide with each other. And what we look at in a simple concussion, be aware, is that the injury progressively resolves but looks. It takes almost a week to 10 days for those symptoms to resolve. And if any of you have ever had um, your head struck and had a mild concussion, you know you're just not yourself for the first couple of days. Generally speaking, there's no further intervention. An athlete can resume sport without further problems after their symptoms have resolved. And this is the most common form that you're going to see. And again, I, I mention this because many of you are asked, because you're health care providers, by your family, by your friends, what should we do? Should I take them in to see a doctor? Well, think about this. The goal is uh, management and rest until all the symptoms resolve, and then a graded program of exertion, which we'll refer to in just one minute. Just briefly, a complex concussion. This is a little bit more involved. These are athletes suffering persistent symptoms, specific sequelae, or prolonged cognitive impairment following the injury. Football players with multiple hits, um, boxers, um, soccer players, it, just any sport with that uh, potential for collision. Um, it includes athletes with multiple concussions or concussions occurring with progressively less impact or force. If a child's had, if anyone's had a concussion, getting another one in a short time frame will produce a cumulative effect, and you want to avoid that at all costs and let the brain recover just like you'd let another body part recover. Some of these requ require formal neuropsychological uh, testing. So if you're asked, one of the things is first light aerobic activity, then sports specific, maybe just running but no contact, non-contract drills, um, touch. Um, running, uh, touching the line, going back, different drills that are used in different sports, <clears throat> full contact practice, and then game play. And this may take at least a week or more to return. And many kids, because of pressure within those highly competitive sports, are returned far too quickly. So we just have to be advocates uh, for those kids. 
So finally, to finish up closed head injury, what are our strategies for field management? If you're a BLS provider, um, basic general assessment is where we start with all of these, and you'll see that included. You need to maintain C-spine precautions, and we'll talk about that as we talk about immobilization in the next um, uh, section. Get a pulse oximeter to find out how well are their oxygen saturations and is that a reliable reading. If their respirations are ineffective for their age, remember in using those age-based guidelines, you may need to begin bag valve mask ventilation and target a normal respiratory rate for that age. Um, you want to check their pupils and see what that response, if they're brisk and equally reactive. If one or both pupils are blown and patient is unresponsive, meaning that pupil is non-reactive, then begin bag valve masking to augment the respiratory efforts. And again, targeting that respiratory support normal for age. You need to reassess the pupils every five minutes. And if that a pupil um, has changed during your frequent assessments to where it's non-reactive, then you can increase the respiratory rate, but this is minimal. No more of this hyperventilation that years ago was reinforced in teaching. It's staying within normal parameters or slightly um, increasing. Um, assess for other traumatic injuries that might be less obvious than that um, deep depressed mental status. And um, if the child is exhibiting any type of seizure activity, make sure you have su sufficient space to prevent contact injury supporting the airway with a jaw thrust to avoid um, neck extension. And obviously, uh, making an expediting transport is going to be essential. With ALS, what you want to make sure is that you have your monitoring equipment um, attached to the patient and fully functioning and assess for any arrhythmia, specifically bradycardia, um, which is a very late sign. Um, also assess the airway and consider um, elective intubation if your bag valve masking is becoming less effective. If the end tidal CO2 monitor, remember we have um, yellow for yes, it's working well, um, is available, then what you want to do is note that after a minute of your assisted ventilation and then about every um, a few minutes to see are you at baseline or is that changing? Has the tube slipped and will you need to return to bag valve mask before re-innovating? Also as an ALS provider, if their Glasgow Coma Score is less than 12 um, and there's concern for poor perfusion, hypotension, which we discussed earlier, why that's so important to monitor, you'll want to check the blood pressure and provide uh, NS bolus of 20 cc's per kilo for um, these patients. Um, to maintain a normal perfusing uh, blood pressure. And that can be um, repeated. So keep that in mind to keep a close eye on all ages with their uh, perfusion status. So if you're an ALS provider and that child does exhibit um, seizure activity that lasts longer than five minutes, based on your local uh, protocols, uh, you may have any one of the uh, anti uh, epileptics that are given, including Versed, Ativan, and uh, Valium related to sedation um, for that uh, patient. Keep in mind your airway um, is your number one goal, and um, different protocols are going to vary. So I would just refer you to your uh, local medical control for medication administration and indications for use of those medications. Um, the final key points related to tra traumatic brain injury. It is the leading cause of childhood death, and hypotension, hypoxia, and either excessive or inadequate ventilation early after traumatic brain injury, injury are associated with worse patient outcomes. So optimizing that short period you have with that patient, whether it be for 10 minutes or for an extended transport over these large areas that we have in the Intermountain West, um, is essential. When a non-reactive pupil um, is observed, that's concerning for a life-threatening increase in intracranial pressure, intracranial pressure. And if present, remember mild hyperventilation, only a 10% change in rate from those normal parameters for age. Aggressive hyperventilation is associated with worse outcomes. Routine pain medications in this particular instance in a patient with an already altered level of consciousness may or may not be indicated. So um, that is something to confirm with your medical control. And um, important, self-limited seizures immediately after traumatic brain injury impact seizures are not associated with worse outcomes. So that's something um, that uh, uh, is important to keep in mind in the uh, bigger spectrum of that patient's recovery. 
Well, let's um, talk about uh, spinal immobilization. And this includes immobilization of the patient's spine from the cervical spine at the um, uh, base of the occipit all the way through the lumbar spine um, to the lower pelvic region to prevent further damage to the spinal vertebrae or spinal cord. And I put this slide in because I think it's, again, what's the continuum of our spine? We start out as an infant with a more C-shaped um, curve, and then these spinal curves develop um, related to gravitational stressors with our thoracic and our lumbar curves in our spine through time. Um, the natural increasing lumbar or lower back lordosis and thoracic kyphosis during adolescence occurs during the adolescence growth spurt. There are muscles, ligaments, and fascia that can all lag behind growth during early puberty, and that's where we can get these um, aches and pains that are transitional in that adolescent uh, population. And then... Um, the one thing to keep in mind is as we get to old age, we kind of return back to that uh, C shape. The fulcrum, and I think this is a key point to keep in mind with pediatrics. When I say fulcrum, where that uh, force is going to exert to provide a, uh, to produce a bend in the cervical spine is higher the younger you are. So for infants, it's all the way up at the C2, C3 level. Then begins to lower by age six, early school age, to C3, C4. And at adolescent reaches where our uh, greater fulcrum or bend is as adults in the C5 to C6. So injuries occur, can occur at the higher levels in the younger child because of based purely on their anatomy. Um, pediatric spine injury patterns, this is key to be aware of because it differs than in adults. When there is a much greater chance for cervical ligament injury. They are so much more elastic than your, their neck cervical ligaments are so much more elastic than yours and mine. The facets, the um, protruding portions of the spine are more horizontally aligned, allowing for greater slippage if those ligaments are loose. Um, the cervical vertebrae are wedge-shaped. Again, another anatomic feature that makes that slippage greater, especially in the presence of loose cervical ligaments. And increased elasticity, which is tough to say, um, in cervical ligaments. Now, finally, we need to talk about seatbelt complex because um, keeping in mind with spinal immobilization, if you come upon a patient, um, and we'll talk about that in the abdominal trauma section, that has... Uh, 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 clearly evident, a braided, contused, linear um, pattern across their lower abdomen, waist, um, lower pelvic area, you have to have a high degree of suspicion because of those forces that are present to produce that external sign that there could be a lumbar fracture. And then because between the outer skin and the lumbar spine is a bowel perforation uh, possible, solid organ injury with the um, kidneys, liver or spleen, and pancreatic injury, depending on if that belt was a little bit higher for that child, um, and it also the more obvious abdominal contusion. So what are the symptoms that indicate the need for immobilization? Well, this list is not a surprise to anyone who's an EMS provider. Um, these are things that are assessed routinely in patients related to trauma. Neck pain or muscle spasm, limited range of motion of the neck, numbness or tingling, in the extremities, arms or legs, bowel or bladder incontinence, hypotension with bradycardia, altered gait if that patient's able to ambulate, muscle weakness, flaccidity, or priapism. These are all things we're so used to assessing. But in the kid, based on their growth and development, this may be a difficult assessment to get in the field. Look at the mechanism of injury that that child um, has experienced. Um, indicating the need for immobilization. Absolutely immobilize if there's obvious head trauma or suspected head trauma. Have they sustained a fall? Has there been axial loading in a diving incident? Facial trauma may be only present as dried blood at the nares. A uh, motor vehicle crash, um, occupant in a motor vehicle crash, or as an auto pedestrian event, or any type of motorsports vehicle event. And although we have what appears to be adult-sized person on this ATV, I can tell you, um, based on our uh, patient population that we see at primary, this age is varied because uh, frequently we have more than one rider on an ATV that could be of any age. 
So one thing I want to make sure that we also take just a slide um, to talk about relates to those symptoms of neurogenic shock. You are all familiar with this, but just as a reminder, this includes bounding pulses, warm extremities, hypotension despite adequate fluid resuscitation for those able to provide that to their patients, bradycardia, and flaccid paralysis. Keep this constellation of symptoms in sign because getting this information on your uh, radio communication, telephone communication to your uh, base medical facility will help to facilitate um, more efficient definitive care for these patients. So um, equipment that's needed for this, um, and for some reason my pictures did not come up, nope. And I apologize for this. Um, well, we had three great pictures, and what they're all going to show are um, you want to use the appropriate size C collar, towel rolls or head blocks to help stabilize the head, a uh, strap and tape to further um, stabilize the head, a backboard with straps across the chest, pelvis, and knees, and using a pediatric backboard if that patient is less than eight years of age. One of the pictures I had, um, and I'm, again, I'm not sure why these aren't up here, is uh, using your large vacuum splints um, to pro fold back to provide, once they're suctioned out, is a great immobilization device for the young toddler. Um, and you may use a car seat for children less than two years of age, using towels to fill in the spaces. And absolutely, once the patient is immobilized, reassess your motor and sensory function um, to make sure there's not been a change from your initial assessment. Uh, clinical exam. This is a common, common question we get all the time. Can we clear the C-spine? Well, if the patient has any type of distracting injury, absolutely not. If they've had any type of narcotic or sedation, absolutely not. And if there's any change in their mental status. So the majority of kids, this is a very difficult thing to do um, in a field environment and does require further evaluation and um, to the point of um, x-rays, radiologic evaluation, um, at the base medical facility. So now we're going to move on and uh, talk about blunt trauma and then penetrating trauma and some of the subtle differences on your assessment findings in that pediatric uh, age group. Blunt trauma, by definition, is a type of physical trauma caused to a body part by direct impact. That impact may cause injury uh, to underlying tissue or organs that is not at all evident um, on your exam, and your degree of suspicion should be raised um, related to any of the activities we've got here, uh, sledding, snowboarding, any type of um, activity invol involving acceleration on a bike or motorized bike. And of course, when you have multiple um, riders on any type of motorized um, uh, um, equipment, uh, that can also produce uh, blunt injury as that child is ejected in any of these situations. Uh, specifically, if the handlebars of this go to of this bike go to hit the abdominal area, you might only have a tiny mark, which we'll see in some of the slides coming up. So here's, we're going to talk about torso trauma, and what I'd like to do is divide it into three parts, the chest, the abdomen, and the pelvis. And the photo you're seeing here is a great example of where we've got a seatbelt contusion that this is all we see externally, but the shearing forces to cause that um, damage to the skin may also call the intestine to shear apart and tear, causing a bowel perforation, and then enough force for the child to bend in half to um, provide uh, the appropriate forces to cause a lumbar fracture. In blunt chest trauma, one of the things you've got to keep in mind is it's the single most common source of um, morbidity as well as mortality in children between 1 and 14 years of age because it can be so deadly if unrecognized. Thoracic injury has a 5% mortality but increases to 40% when you have additional head and abdominal trauma. So this is a kid with multiple injuries, either struck by a car, um, ejected out of a vehicle, uh, any number of scenarios that you can all um, think about in your um, careers that you've come upon. Um, and when we get to the hospital, we use um, CT scans um, uh, in addition to chest x-ray to identify to further uh, differentiate where that trauma would be. Now, why do we have to worry about chest trauma? What's so different in kids? 
Well, they've got an incredibly compliant chest wall, and their ribs are far more horizontal, less angulated um, than the a fully developed adult thoracic uh, rib cage. Uh, they've got very rudimentary intercostal muscles that tire easily, and their terminal airways all the way down as you go down um, the uh, trachea into the bronchus and get closer in those tiny terminal airways near the alveoli, those can easily um, tear and um, then not provide the best environment for good oxygenation and ventilation uh, for the patient. Uh, they have a very mobile mediastinal structure with their heart and great vessels, and that's because of the increased elastin in those great vessels. So there's tremendous shearing. And the reason I bring that up is you'll never see that on exam, but if you look at where that, the distance the child was ejected, how far they fell from that window or ski lift, um, what type of impact they took, there could be enough stretch that the, those vessels actually get a tear in them, and that can cause a life-threatening um, problem for the child. When we look at the belly, the abdomen specifically, what we see are weaker, less developed abdominal muscles and a much thinner abdominal wall. Diaphragmatic disruption from severe blunt trauma or crush, crush injury can happen um, because we have a less protected abdominal cavity. Um, the abdominal viscera are, have large, thick capsules. These little toddlers have very protuberant, or meaning just the cute little bellies that we love about them. And um, the one other part is these abdominal structures are incredibly vascular. So disruption in the spleen, the liver, the kidneys can cause significant um, hypovolemic shock due to acute hemorrhage from the trauma. Uh, as you, we look at other parts, the liver and spleen are far less protected either by the rib cage or by general uh, body fat and muscles that adults have. Uh, the kidneys are far more mobile and less protected. The lower urinary tract um, has a higher potential for disruption, especially when you get blunt pelvic trauma or very, very common straddle injuries that we see in pediatrics. And um, because you've got a flexible pelvis, fractures are uncommon, but I can't, um, um, I can't uh, stress enough that those, you'll get that stretching and shear, and that's where the underlying organs may have disruption, um, bladder, urinary tract um, involvement is common. Uh, so what do we see? What are the type of injuries? Well, if you've got abdominal wall contusions or an abrasion, what I want you to think, if you see those in the upper quadrants above um, the belly button, then think about the pancreas or duodenal injury or either solid organ injury, including liver or spleen. And that's because that little pancreas in the, the first part of your small intestine, the duodenum, is um, so, um, it, it does not have the protection. And you get blunt force with a handlebar to that upper abdomen. What happens is now that intestine has a big hole in it or a big blood clot forming um, from the forces it sustained, or the pancreas becomes transected. So if you have any abdominal wall contusions or abrasions in the lower quadrants, think intestinal perforation. Um, abdominal distension, if you're able to place an NG tube to um, decrease that uh, uh, gastric distension and pressure in the abdominal compartment, that's awesome. If um, we've got this lap belt complex, which is the outside contusion, the inside intestinal injury, and then a spinal fracture. Um, this is the key. Booster seats help provide better placement of car restraints with the lap and shoulder belt, so we have less of these injuries than the lap and shoulder belts used um, alone with very small children. Um, blunt trauma, as we've just discussed, can very widely have minor complaints to severe shock when you come upon that patient in a field environment, and it's really dependent on the mechanism of injury and what organs sustained injury. And I've shown here, um, remember, with a deep inspiration, um, this diaphragm that covers the top of the liver, this will all be down a little bit, and you might have a combination of thoracic injury and abdominal trauma, depending if that patient was in a deep inspiration or expiration at the time of injury. Um, this also just goes uh, to serve as a reminder for 
the placement of the stomach, and then uh, intestinal compartments. Here is a classic example of a handlebar, this circular contusion in the middle of the um, belly, which is all we see, and that can be a completely perforated um, intestinal injury underneath that. But what you will see is the kids tachycardic. They're tachypnic. They've got that shallow respiratory effort, and they have increased pain. If they are awake and alert, the kid will say, ow, that hurts. I mean, they, they're not going to try to disguise it. They will tell you. If they have an altered mental status, your clinical exam skills are going to become even more important. Uh, so to treat BLS support with blunt trauma, again, basic pediatric assessment with appearance, breathing, and circulation. And if they are in severe distress in any of those areas, then absolutely expedite transport or develop a rendezvous point um, if that's a part of your uh, transport uh, plan. Maintain the airway by administering high flow oxygen by um, non-rebreather mask. If respirations become ineffective, you've got to supplement that with bag valve mask. And then don't forget, as these kids get greater gastric distension, they may have vomiting and having adequate suction in smaller kids with a large bore flexible catheter in larger kids with the uh, traditional suction devices is key to maintain a patent airway. Again, BLS, we can't stress enough um, spinal immobilization because we aren't aware of any, um, if there's um, acute injury to that uh, spinal cord or not. Get direct pressure on any obvious external hemorrhage, and you want to expose to see, does that kid who had that big bruise in the belly also have a deformed thigh showing a mid-shaft femur fracture? And this is, again, where your total body assessment gives more information to the base medical control so we can get things moving and have um, the correct resources ready upon uh, your arrival. Uh, finally, again, we can't um, talk about pediatrics without talking about maintaining warmth. Small children, infants, have a large surface area over their head, keeping their head covered, whether it's with a blanket or sheet or a hat if you have it. Um, you need to minimize heat loss. And with that, assess their mental status every 15 minutes during uh, transport using the Glasgow Coma Scale or AFPU tools. And this is, again, you'll see this throughout the presentation. These are uh, key parts for you for is the child still remaining alert? Are they only responding to verbal stimuli? Are they only responding to painful stimuli? Or now are they unresponsive? And let your medical control know if that assessment has changed. Again, in conjunction using your Glasgow Coma resources for that age appropriate. Um, for ALS support, obviously, and blunt trauma, follow the BLS um, procedures. But make sure with your monitoring, with cardiorespiratory, pulse oximetry, um, that you see is that patient transitioning and changing and now may be requiring um, intubation. Also, do they require IV access to maintain good perfusion? And you've heard this over and over, but it's the gold standard, 20 cc's per kilo, repeating that if there's ongoing shark. With spinal shock that may be present with blunt trauma, then keep in mind um, you may have, after discussion, um, either um, in your offline protocols or online discussion with your medical control, um, be giving some epinephrine. And again, I've just thrown the pediatric vital signs as another reminder. Use your reference cards to know where you're at as you still maybe have another 15 minutes of transport. Are you still staying within parameters or has uh, that changed? The target respiratory rates, these are um, related to our bag valve masking that we've referred to earlier. Uh, and then um, you may need to initiate uh, pain medication uh, related to uh, that child's response. Um, reassess their mental status, vital signs, and uh, pain score, and transport for evaluation. So if that's blunt trauma, we'll briefly just talk about penetrating trauma as our time is um, winding down here, and I do briefly want to um, make sure we get to the non-accidental. Uh, this is, uh, by definition, trauma as a result of an object at high velocity entering the body through the skin, to causing an open wound, but keep in mind also injury to the internal tissues and underlying structures. So we're only seeing like the tip of the iceberg when we see uh, these um, external um, penetrating uh, injuries that are present. Um, they're rare in the pediatric population where we see an entire evisceration. Um, it can be a result of both accidental and intentional uh, injury. 
The injury severity depends on the potential involvement of the vital structures underneath. We, I can't tell you how many times we've had penetrating objects miraculously miss every major thing they could. Again, none of us can explain it, but it happens. And so be aware, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg and be aware what's the anatomy underneath, what's my potential for further injury. And that could include blood vessels, nerve tissue, or internal organs. These patients with penetrating trauma can present in shock from ongoing blood loss if uh, blood vasculature has been disrupted to a great extent. They have potential for infection. What was it that penetrated their body? And obviously altered mental status. Re again, for BLS support, just a, your general, what's the patient's appearance, breathing, and circulation for your initial assessment. And if they're in severe distress, just work on getting um, them transported to definitive care. While you're doing that, maintain high flow oxygen and suction as needed. And here is an example of the head blocks we talked about in spinal immobilization. Um, you want to get your spinal immobilization protocol as indicated and get direct pressure to obvious hemorrhage, depending, again, on that body part and how you're able to immobilize. Um, you can see here, I um, have this photo of a scalp laceration that's all cleaned up, but initially extensive, extensive blood, blood clots, um, blood dried in the hair. So we had no idea how um, large this injury was. So keep in mind, um, you may not have the luxury, you just have to assume we're going to have a uh, significant uh, blood loss. Um, when you're exposing, you, you don't want to, you want to look for the obvious injury, but don't attempt to remove the penetrating object. In this case, this child had a pencil, and this pencil, as you can see here, is three and three quarter inches long into the skull. And again, you don't know that when you only see this small amount on the exterior side. So, um, do not attempt to remove it and maintain the warmth as, um, you're able. Assess your mental status, we've talked about that, and transport. Um, this mental status could obviously uh, transition over time, so it's something you need to stay on top of. ALS providers are going to watch the trend in um, vital signs and consider innovation if their ventilatory status has become compromised. And as we've mentioned over and over again today, significant blood loss, we need to get active lines in and get active um, perfusion status, um, especially if you um, are having uh, longer transports. Um, assess the mental status, vital signs, pain score, and then transport um, with your team to medical care. Finally, our last group is the non-accidental trauma group. And, you know, it's by definition an act or commission or failure to protect of uh, caregiver that results in harms to a child's physical development and emotional state. And I think if you keep in mind, this isn't just physical abuse, this isn't just sexual abuse, this is emotional abuse and neglect are very much a part of this constellation that we have to as adults become advocate for these kids because they cannot be their own advocates. Um, Health care providers have responsibilities. Every one of us has a responsibility to suspect potential for abuse, protect the patient from further abuse, respect those involved and provide respectful environment, collect information to help provide uh, a good um, base for the appropriate agencies to act on, and then obviously report. Um, you need to look for circumstances as you suspect injury um, or actions from the child or child caregiver. Document all your observations. If a history doesn't sound right, what's the environment look like? Is it too cold or hot? Is it clean or dirty? Is there unusual conditions that you just think, how could that story fit with what someone told me? That's what we need to um, report because sometimes adults are reporting things that are not appropriate for that developmental stage of that child. To protect the child, you need to become their advocate. Provide medical care for their injuries. Get them transported to a, a medical facility. And recognize you need to make efforts to remove the child from the situation. You need to control your emotions. Their uh, law enforcement and uh, Department of Family Services um, will work to investigate and um, uh, provide um, 
hopefully uh, good information to prevent that child from suffering more abuse, but to become angry or um, emotionally involved at the time you're called on the scene does not benefit the child. And it's very difficult, especially if that child looks like your child or you've had a similar occurrence. This is a highly emotionally charged environment to work in. Um, with respect, what we're talking about is communicating appropriately with family or caregivers that are there at the scene. Avoid confrontation, be non-judgmental, and avoid accusations. Get law enforcement involved and transfer to um, ensure patient safety. And just provide good documentation. It's tough, but oh so essential. Record the statements and put quotation marks around those. So these are not your words. They're their words for how they're describing an incident. And be careful what you write and say, because all of this information is part of um, what can be used uh, for prosecution and in a court uh, setting. Um, you, need to, you have the responsibility to report suspected abuse and neglect to emergency departments, law enforcement, and child family services. In Utah, the number I have listed here is, um, you can call this number for any county and it directs you to the specific counties. It's 1-800-678-9399. Each of your states has a reference number. Make sure you have that readily available, visible for all EMS providers so no one um, needs to be hesitant. Um, you can make these calls and um, provide that information, and it, it's essential. Um, the main points, just to keep in mind, child maltreatment occurs in every single ethnic and socioeconomic group. It is not limited. The risk factors include children less than five years old, drug or alcohol abuse in the same environment, and domestic violence in the same environment. Um, we talked about physical, emotional, sexual abuse, and neglect. In children less than two years old, the most common form of abuse is shaken baby syndrome. Um, the mortality here is 25% of those affected with it, which is remarkable. Those who survive have a significant morbidity and associated uh, with the uh, effects of the traumatic brain injury they sustained. One note that I just want you all to hear and take to heart is that of all abused children, 50% will be abused again. And of those with recurrent abuse, the mortality is 5%. This is why we have to become their advocates and why we have to uh, report. Um, finally, with injury prevention, just the last couple slides for those of you who have been so um, patient and polite to stick with me through this, um, a lot of material. Uh, we need to recognize, and this is my firm belief, all adults do not recognize potentially dangerous injury-producing activities for children. And that is why we have jobs, because we are seeing some of those effects. Now, you can't know everything, but there are a lot of situations where someone just wasn't thinking before they let that uh, younger child be involved in an uh, activity. Common errors that you see with child seats are, in this, this is a classic example with this picture here, this seat not being securely fastened in a vehicle. Um, 33% of the time, the whole harness isn't even snug. Uh, the harness straps are not even routed correctly through the appropriate um, uh, position, whether they're forward or rear facing. This clip right here is far below the nipple line, which is where it should be so that those harnesses can work. And if you untwisted this, also it would be helpful. Um, and we talked about the retainer clip. And then the lap belt, not in locked um, mode as that safety belt is um, secured in the vehicle. Um, the thing about child, present, child restraint use is anyone who is a parent or who has ever transported a child knows this. It's an inconsistent approach as the kid gets older. You've got a carpool. Oh, you know, we're just going to go here. We're going to load everybody in and go. And then all of a sudden you get rear-ended or something happens and kids get bumped in the um, vehicle. Multiple vehicles per family and multiple types of seats. You know, um, not everyone um, feels like, oh, we're just going to go here or, oh, we never use that car for the kids, so um, we're not going to move the seats or we're just going to take a short trip. And that's the big one, short, quick trips versus a planned car travel. The shorter the trip, the less likely uh, re restraints, both seats and seat belts are used appropriately because people think it's just a, quote, short trip. Um, the other thing is pedestrian. Remember, kids less than 10 years of age are impulsive. They have a difficult time judging speed. Spatial relations. How far is that car from me? Do I have enough time to run across to meet up with my buddies or not? And 
Keep in mind, it's hard to see here, but 46%, almost half of the pediatric deaths occurred in the late afternoon and early evening. What are they doing? They're coming home from school. They're coming home from friends' houses, um, moving between houses. 84% of pediatric deaths in, um, not, were in non-intersection locations in those auto versus pets. That's why schools are so vigilant about school crossings, people to be aware, um, making kids follow the rules, which is difficult, but it's the structure that we need to work with. Um, one of the uh, last things I'd like to mention is a program available across the United States that originated here in Utah, and that's the Spot the Tot. We have a number of these very high-profile vehicles, whether they're trucks or uh, multi-passenger vehicles, um, that cannot see a small child. And not all have the fancy cameras, and not everyone uses their fancy cameras. And so spotting the tot is a huge thing to prevent driveway um, rollovers and uh, injuries. Um, also, combining any type of combination of um, firearms, motorized vehicles, different substances is not a great idea with kids or if you're supervising kids because it's a recipe for disaster, and we frequently see those, um, and you all see those as you respond to these calls. Um, I'd like to thank everyone again for their um, uh, participation in today's outreach. I'd like to thank Russ from University of Utah, and uh, we look forward to any feedback you have regarding this presentation because our goal is to get great information so we can all provide great care. A question we got here from the Salt Lake area was whether we use 3% uh, saline or mannitol with our head injured patients. The answer is yes, but only in the intensive care environment. We do um, not use 3% as a field uh, fluid resuscitation solution, and uh, mannitol is um, used in a much more restricted sense uh, by our flight teams under close uh, medical control. It's not used as often as it was in the past. Please contact um, Russ with the University of Utah Outreach EMS Grand R Trauma Grand Rounds, and he will um, provide information from this um, lecture to you, as you guys obviously don't have uh, handouts. Thanks again.